Hey everybody, my name is Daniel Fusco, and welcome to Bite Size Bible, where we take a small section of the scriptures, a bite size, and we look at what does this say to us about who God is and about who we are. I'm really excited because today we're going to be studying Psalm 139, verses 17 and 18. I'll be honest, I have loved Psalm 139 my entirety of my Christian life, and I love getting to kind of break open this powerful song by David about who God is and how he lives in response to who God is. And so we've already seen previously, going through verses 1 to 16, David's been really unpacking all the different omnis, you know, that, that God is omniscient, God knows everything, right? And then God is omnipresent, God is always everywhere. He, he's, no matter where you go, he's there. And that God is omnipotent, God is all-powerful, God created and sustains him. And now we land at verses 17 and 18, and you get the sense that David is just in awe of God. And we are all hardwired to worship, and so we need to make sure that we place our worship in the right place, and that is on the Lord. And we allow who God is to really drive the way that we live our lives. So I'm really excited to get into Psalm 139, verses 17 and 18 with you today. So it says this in verse 17. It says, How precious are your thoughts to me, O God, and how great are the sum of them, if I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Now, this begins by a simple phrase that God's thoughts are precious. How precious are your thoughts to me, O God? Now, this is important because the word precious in the Hebrew language literally means it's weighty, right? And so the idea is, is that everybody is entitled to their opinion, but God's thoughts should hold greater weight than anybody else's thoughts. Now, here's what I want to tell you, and I'm going to say that again. God's thoughts should hold more weight than anybody else's because we live in a world where everyone shares their opinion and, and we have all these different ways that opinions get amplified and copied and you hear them over and over again. But really David is, is saying, God, your thoughts are more weighty to me than anybody else's thoughts. And I would say to you this way, that God's thoughts are found in God's word. And that is why it is so important for us to be people who are studying the scriptures people who know what God's word says, because our culture, whatever culture we live in is going to define us one way, but God's word tells us who we are. And I like to tell people, you want to understand how God thinks about you, you have to look at the cross, because the cross teaches us that we are sinners in need of a savior, right? That, that we're messed up, but also that we are loved with an everlasting love so much that God would send his own son on a rescue mission for us. And so when we grab hold of God's thoughts, we don't, we're not overly optimistic or kind of exceedingly pessimistic about who we are. We see us as flawed, but loved and redeemed. And really, we want God's thoughts to be the driving thoughts between not only how we see ourselves, but how we see other people. So there's a question that's going to be coming up. I realize that for some of you, you're doing this with a group of people in a small group, a community group. And if that's you, this is the question you're going to discuss. I also realize many of you are just uh, watching these videos or listening to this as part of your own personal devotional time. So don't rush past the question. The questions are, are designed to take us a little bit deeper, and we want God to do that. So go ahead, and I'll be right back with you. When you consider the precious thoughts of God towards you, what emotion do you feel? Why do you feel that way? How can you invite the Holy Spirit to help you with your thought life? Now, as we pick up in the middle of verse 17, we've already seen that God's thoughts are precious, but then he says, how great are the sum of them? If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. Now, I like to say it this way, that God's thoughts are numerous, right? So, so really what he's saying is that he is aware that as a creature who God has created, he can't even fathom just the, the volume and, and the intensity of the, of the mind of God. And that's got a beautiful thing because one of the mistakes that we can make as people is we think we really know what's going on. And all through the scripture, we have these accounts of God doing one thing and nobody realizes what's happening. And so God's thoughts are numerous. He's like, listen, the thoughts that you have, God, are beyond my comprehension. That's the idea. There'd be as many as the sand. I mean, who knows how many grains of sand there are in all the beaches in the world that have ever existed. And so David is saying, your thoughts are just beyond my comprehension. And you get the sense, again, that David is, is worshiping. And so the key for us is to humble ourselves before God and trust God in what he's doing. And the Apostle Paul calls this 
the mind of Christ, which you can read about at the very end of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that we put on the mind of Christ, and it allows us to not only weight God's thoughts greater than anybody else's, but also realize that God's expansive mind is beyond our comprehension. And so we learn how to trust Him and surrender to Him on the journey. Now, there's that question that's going to come up again. In your groups, you're going to talk about it on your own. Grab a journal. Seek the Lord about it. About it, And let's let him take us a little bit deeper. What is one thing Jesus asked you to do last week, either through prayer, time in his word, or time in community group? Did you obey his leading and prompting? Why or why not? Man, we've only been studying two verses. We've seen that God's thoughts are precious and God's thoughts are numerous. But verse 18 ends with something really, really powerful, which says, when I awake, I am still with you. And I would say it this way, my friends, God's presence is everything. The story of the Bible is the story of the presence of God in the lives of people. And God's presence is as available to us today as it has ever been in all time, because on this side of the finished work of Jesus, God's spirit dwells within those who believe in Jesus. As Jesus said, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And what you realize is that God wants us to become more and more aware of who he is, that he is always with us, and that we live our lives simply responding to Jesus in response to who he is. And so one of the things that I believe God wants all of us to do is really cultivate a greater awareness of God's presence. And I always think about in Exodus chapter 33, where after all the mistakes that God gave the law, the mistakes of the golden calf, you know, God said, listen, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest in the promised land. And Moses says, if your presence doesn't go with us, Lord, lead us not from here. What makes the promised land the promised land is the presence of God. And you and I get to live in a perpetual promised land because of the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so the key for us is as we move through our busy and oftentimes fragmented lives that we could really be aware of the presence of God. So there's one final question. Talk about in your groups on your own. Let's let this question drive us deeper with God. What are three practical things you could do today to help you remain in the presence of God? From this list of three, pick one to do right now. Text a friend and let them know you're going to begin being more intentional about walking in the presence of God. Well, it's been awesome having you today here on Bite Size Bible as we studied Psalm 139, verses 17 and 18. How awesome would it be if we waited God's thoughts higher than anybody else's. We found ourselves in awe and worshiping God at just the vast wisdom that he has, and we cultivated an ever-increasing awareness of his presence. Sounds an awful lot like the abundant life to me. So thanks for joining me, Daniel Fusco, on this edition of Bite Size Bible. I'll see you next time. God bless.